And now seeking the Lord's blessing, let's turn in our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. And beginning the reading at verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah on the, his right hand, and Pedaiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kilita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaiah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law, while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And thus far, the reading of God's holy word. Well, returning to our study of the book of Nehemiah, we're continuing to look at what is found in chapter 8. And today we want to focus our attention on the centrality of the word of God in the public assembly of God's people on the Sabbath day. Now, last week we concentrated on the assembly of God's people. On the Sabbath day. That is what the word church literally means a called out assembly. Christians are not merely called out of the world, they are called out of the world to be assembled before the Lord. When the Lord Jesus returns, he will descend with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet. The dead in Christ will rise, and together with those who are alive on that day, they will be caught up together, assembled as the church. And that's what the word church literally means, ecclesia, the assembly. And this is why on every Sabbath day, whether the weekly Sabbath of the moral law or the ceremonial Sabbath of the law of Moses, there was always a holy convocation. If you look at Leviticus 23, all of the feast days, including the moral Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, and then all of the ceremonial Sabbaths of the feast days, they all had a holy convocation, an assembly of God's people. That's what the church is. And this is what we studied from Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. 
Do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Some Christians develop a habit of neglecting to gather with the church. And like all habits, the longer it goes on, the harder it becomes to break. When you come together as a church, writes the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, when you come together, he says, wait for one another. It's important that the whole congregation is assembled together. Now, the fact that the Corinthians were told by Paul to wait for everyone implies that it was harder for some to get to church on time than for others, just as it would have been on this day in the book of Nehemiah. There would have been those who lived right there next to the city, as well as those who were in the hill country. However, even though it's difficult for some for different reasons, there still is the obligation. It's an obligation that we should want to keep out of a loving heart, love for God and love for His church. That's what we focused on last week. There's one other thing we're going to address about the assembly, and I'll get to that in a moment. But as we continue looking at this chapter, we're going to start to move our attention upon the reading and preaching of God's Word in the assembly of the church. The centrality of the Word. Now again, let's look at verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate... And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded God. Notice, they told Moses. The assembly, the church, told Moses, bring us the law of Moses. Bring out the Bible, Ezra. And you know, this is what the gathered church should want most of all when it comes to the public assembly. To hear the word of God. Now you know, there are many reasons for going to church. And there are many reasons why people go to church today. Friends and family, meeting with friends and family to enjoy fellowship is a reason for going to church. And that's a nice reason, it's a good reason. Because there is to be a fellowship of the saints, a communion of the saints. It's to be a time of great joy. I was glad when I heard them saying, let's go to the Lord's house. Our feet will soon be standing in your courts. That's a good reason to attend church. But sometimes Christians, and I think particularly today, want to go to church for a show, to be entertained, to go to listen to music, or to have some kind of experience at worship. Sometimes Christians may want to go to church in order to give their children an occupation, something to keep their time. There are children programs there and church school there and so on, and we can bring our children to go to these times where they can go to these classes and so on. Something to do for them. But here from Nehemiah 1, we see a very important principle. And that is the most important thing that the congregation should look forward to is hearing God's Word. That they would be there for the opening of God's Word in its proclamation through the reading as well as the preaching and teaching. This should be the highest desire of the congregation. A hunger and a thirst for God's Word. You know, this is fundamental to Reformation. This is fundamental to really building the kingdom of God. When the church wants to hear God's Word, what does the Lord say? when they're ready to conform their lives to what God says. Teach us how we should live. Isn't it interesting that when the crowds went out to see 
um, John the Baptist, what did they go out to see? They went to see a prophet, and they went to see that prophet because they had a hunger to know what God would say to them. They asked him, how should we live? What should we do? As he pointed them to salvation in Jesus Christ. You see, this is when real reformation takes root. And that's why we need to see this in this portion of Scripture. It's very important. Now, there's something else, though, I want to bring out when it comes to being assembled to hear the Word of God that we find in this chapter. Look down again at these verses and notice the composition, beginning at verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And by the way, let's just remember, at this point, these scriptures, the law of Moses, were a thousand years old. A thousand years old, and yet that congregation wanted to hear them. Why? Because God's word is always relevant. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he always speaks to his people throughout all of history. Verse 2, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, literally, that's the church, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard. Here's the congregation. Men, women, and all who could understand. Now this is referring to young children who are capable of understanding. Because the assembly of God's people on the holy convocations always included the households and the families, including the children. For example, if you turn back to Ezra chapter 10 and verse 1, you'll see another Holy Convocation with Ezra there. And notice what's said, Ezra 10, verse 1. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel. And then if you turn back to Deuteronomy in chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. And look at verses 12 and 13. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. And then finally, turn to the prophet Joel. The prophet Joel. And chapter 2, and verses 15 and 16. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. The holy assembly of God's people. This is the church. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Psalm 34, verses 9 through 11. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, children, obey your parents. Paul is directly addressing the children of the congregation. Why? Because they would be assembled in the church's of Ephesus to hear the scripture read. Now, when you read the whole letter of Ephesians, I mean, even the most mature among us may scratch our heads 
and stretch our minds in our attempt to comprehend all that is written in the book of Ephesians. The children wouldn't understand everything written in, in Ephesians, but they would hear this. Children, children, obey your parents. Psalm 148, verses 7 to 13. Praise the Lord from the earth, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Can you finish the rest of it? Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Listen very carefully. The blessings of the kingdom of heaven belong to our little children. Even our infant children. The Lord Jesus Christ has said to such belong the kingdom of heaven. Do not hinder them. Jesus says to parents, do not hinder your children from coming to me. God's word and his kingdom has been given to your little children. And you are not to keep them away from that blessing. Now again, this is a different matter than the matter of what our little children do with that blessing. Right? We can address that at another time. Paul writes to Timothy, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. And part of the reason why Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures was because his mother and his grandmother took him to hear the Word of God in the public assemblies. Question for you. Question for you. Is it easier to come to church with or without little children? Another question. Does the Lord know the answer to that? Does the Lord know your trials and tribulations? Does he know your hardships? Is he not a sympathetic high priest? Does he not know when you pray to him concerning burdens that you have? Do you trust that he actually hears you and understands you? Does he not know that to bring young children to the public assembly can be difficult? It can be difficult. And this is something that the entire church needs to understand. Church, church can be a noisy place. Church can be a noisy place. It's something that many of us have to get used to, how libraries have changed. You know, when I was a kid, you could hear your heartbeat when you walked into a library. No one would say anything. If you whispered too loud, the librarian would be on top of you. You could hear a pin drop on carpet. But today, it's like a lunchroom. It's a noisy place. Well... Sometimes we think of church ought to be like the way the library used to be. Absolute silence. But you know what? Church can be a noisy place. In Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 24, we read this. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Yeah, that's right. The Lord Jesus read the scriptures and he taught as a rabbi ordained to that pur purpose. And there was the holy assembly. <coughs> Goes on to say, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now there's a disturbance in the Holy Assembly. And did Jesus say, remove that person? No, he directly, authoritatively gave him the word, come out. And it was with a shriek that he came out. 
Do you think the synagogues where Jesus read the scriptures and taught were absolute places of silence? Can you not think in your mind of the groaning and the moans of those who suffered with terrible pains that were brought into the synagogue to hear Jesus preached? Or all those families? Did they all have perfect children who were quiet in those synagogues? Do you think that the holy assemblies of the church, including this day, when they gathered there in the square before Ezra, that the infants and the children present there made no noise whatsoever. Do you think it was easy for all of these families? Was it easy to bring a demon-possessed man to church? Now some of you are thinking, what are you calling my kid demon-possessed? And Our kids may shriek, but that's, we trust not demon possession by any means. The point is, is that it's not easy. And church is not always a silent place. Now, listen very carefully. These words are meant to be an encouragement to all of you. This is not a beating down on anyone. You should take encouragement from this. And renew your strength in this. There is an unbiblical stigma associated with fussy children in church. It's an unbiblical stigma. And at the root of it, there can also be an element of pride that goes on. You know, as we compare ourselves with one another, and that's something that we, by sinful uh, disposition, do so often. We compare ourselves with others others. You know, how well our family does versus another, or how difficult our family is versus another, and that whole plan. All of these things are wrong. Parents sometimes think, my child doesn't sit still and is disruptive, and I'm spending my whole time in church just trying to keep my child quiet for the rest of the congregation. What are they going to think of me? What a a disturbance. I cannot pay attention myself. And I'm not getting anything out of the preaching. There are many Christian parents who go through that struggle. Indeed, I think it's safe to say that every Christian parent has gone through that struggle more than once. But for others in the congregation who are at a different stage of life. And remember, life is experienced in stages, in seasons. We're all children, and then we become young adults, adults, and then we become old people. Those are stages. And there can be some in the congregation who are in a different stage of life and who become irritated or agitated about the cries and fusses of someone's young child in worship. And that's wrong. That's wrong. You know, sometimes I'm asked, did you hear that baby? Was that difficult to preach over those cries? You know, it doesn't bother me one bit whatsoever. It doesn't bother me one bit. Yes, I will elevate my voice because I need to prevail. But it doesn't bother me one, bo- one bit at all. Would you rather have a congregation of nothing but old people who are absolutely silent, where you could just listen to the preaching for yourself? Or should you not rejoice to hear even fussy children who are being brought into the assemb- assembly? Now, The wrong attitude and the wrong solution to fussy children. The wrong solution is to remove them from the assembly. As we have seen, our infants and our children have been given the kingdom of heaven. They are not to be hindered or kept from coming to Jesus. They are to be brought to church. And the Bible shows us that the holy convocation, the assembled church, includes 
the children. So parents and everyone here should clearly understand this, that it is our responsibility to have the little children here together with us in the assembly. When you come together as a church, that includes all of the assembly, old, young, little, and infants. Staying at home or removing these individuals from the assembly is not an option. Now, it may be that some children need training. And there are many resources, whether they be books or whether they be other experienced Christians who can help with this training. But let's also remember that not every child is the same. Some may be more stubborn and that by temperament than others. And it can be difficult. And parents with young children may succumb to the thought that it would be easier to not come to church rather than to wrestle with my child throughout the whole service. After all, we the parents aren't getting anything out of the service. We're not getting anything out of it. All we're doing is just struggling to keep this little one under control. Well, what you need to accept as a parent of a young child is that this is a season of your life. You might not personally gain much from the worship service during this season. But remember, you're not just going to church to serve yourself. You are going to church to serve your child. And what you are doing every Lord's Day from infancy is teaching them that they belong to the assembly of God's people. You are teaching them that they are part of this visible church. You are training your infants and your young children to gather for worship. And in order to do that, you may have to sacrifice the freedom you once enjoyed, where you could sit quietly and give your full attention to the reading and preaching. Because this is part of a responsibility. You may have to sacrifice that blessing because you're serving your child. This is something that I say over and over and over again. Your attendance at church is not just about yourself. It's about edifying others, other Christians, using your gifts to be an encouragement to the others who are gathering there. If you don't come to church, then you don't help anybody else. You're only serving yourself. And when you bring your children to church from their infancy, you are serving your children. It is for this reason, it's for this reason, and others may disagree, but it's for this reason that I'm opposed to having a nursery in church. Now, a cry room is acceptable. I mean, if a child is going ballistic and screeches are getting to a certain decibel lesson level, then you can bring a child, an infant, out of, for a temporary time. It may be that a child needs to be taken someplace quietly and given a spanking. But you know, there are some who advocate for nurseries, and the reason why is so that the parents can be able to listen to the sermon. It's my opinion that parents should understand that taking care of babies and young children is just one of the many responsibilities that come with the blessing of having children. This extra trial and, and, and hardship that you're, that you're experiencing in, in keeping your kid in the assembly is part of the work of being a parent. Everything about having young children is more work. Changing their diapers, feeding them, dressing them. At this time of the year, parents with young children, you know, putting on winter clothing. What a chore. Getting them into car seats, making sure that they're all there. It's all 
difficult work. But it's a season of life. It's a season of life. And what you are doing when you're wrestling, even with an unruly child in church, is that you are giving them the example. You are here to hear the word of God. And it's just one of the difficult responsibilities of raising your children. But this is how you serve them. And you do not serve your child if you keep them away from church. Now, for those who don't have any young children, understand, they belong to the assembly. They belong here among us. And be thankful. Be thankful. Now, obviously, parents should not let their children just go wild. We want to train our children to sit still and be attentive. But it is work. And it's going to result many times with temporary disturbances. And that's okay. That is perfectly okay. I want to draw that out. It's an important point in this passage. But now we need to continue and notice more about this assembly for the preaching of God's word. I want you to notice the location, the location of where this took place. If you look down at verses 2 and 3 once again. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. The water gate. Here is where we see them gathering together as a holy assembly to hear the word. Notice it wasn't at the temple. It wasn't at the gates of the temple. The temple itself was the place where the sacrifices were offered. And that was to be done under the Old Testament, under the Old Testament, at the temple alone. That's the place where the sacrifice was because it was on that mountain where the Lord Jesus Christ would be sacrificed. And those sacrifices are pointing to his sacrifice. But the reading and the preaching of the word, praising and praising God, could be done in any location. Every location was acceptable. In fact, the weekly Sabbath was commanded to be observed wherever God's people lived. It was to be a holy convocation, Leviticus 23.3 says, in all your dwelling places. And so here... The water gate is selected as the place of gathering. It was large enough. It was suitable enough. And it also was interestingly next to the water gate. Why is that significant? Because the water gate really reminds us. Remember when we talked about the gates of Jerusalem, the symbolism behind the gates of Jerusalem, the water gate reminds us of the washing of the word, the washing of the word, the work of sanctification. Sanctification comes by hearing and understanding the word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is where the people of God gather to be washed and cleansed and sanctified. And that's precisely what we're going to see as we proceed through the remainder of this chapter. At this point, let's ask God's blessing as we close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for the word of God and that we can be gathered together to hear your word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would encourage all of your people to assemble regularly in this great holy convocation to be blessed of you in the administration of your word and the sacraments. We pray for your blessing, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, let's conclude by turning in our Psalters to Psalm 96, Selection C. Psalm 96, Selection C. And let's stand and sing and remain standing for the benediction.